the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, Marcel Bloch's strategic airliner, Triathlon, mid-tier strike aircraft, and Metal Beasts, the Austrian APFSDS machine gun. The Austrian Curassier light tank was created by a Viennese company called Zaurer Werk in the late 1960s. The engineers based their design on the AMX-13 and a local APC. The French tank provided some ideas for the turret, while the latter loaned its chassis. This machine can be found in both the French and German tech trees at a battle rating of 9.3. Its main gun is a 105mm cannon with an autoloader and elevation angles between minus 6 and plus 13 degrees. There's also a machine gun and smoke grenades. The engine compartment is found in the rear. The driver sits in the front, while both the gunner and the commander are in the turret next to the automated ammo racks. The rest of the ammunition is spread in the central part of the tank. Speaking of ammunition, we recommend you limit your choice to two types of rounds. The main one should be an APFSDS, since its penetration rate is high enough to handle basically any armor on that battle rating. Only a handful of the enemy will require aiming for vulnerable areas. The second type we recommend is the smoke shells. They're pretty handy when you need to confuse an enemy or pass a dangerous area safely. The reason for this is that the Curassier's mobility is clearly lacking for a light tank. With only 18 horsepower per ton of weight, it's closer to a medium machine and also its reverse speed is below 9 km per hour. Pretty much a, a very fast walking speed. But it, it's still a light tank with paper-thin armor, so you'll have to avoid enemy fire at all costs even from an SBAAG. We might also remind you that many machines at rank 5 and 6 are equipped with stabilizers, while the Curassier isn't. Instead, it has an auto-loader, a thermal sight, and a fire control system helping you make your long-distance shots more accurate. Which means this tank performs great on large open swaths of space. The only thing you need to keep in mind is the modest depression angles. Choose your position accordingly. Once you do find a good one, your course of action is simple. Find an enemy with your thermals, check the distance with the laser rangefinder for the computer to calculate the offset, and point your crosshair right at them. The first 13 rounds, one in the breach, 12 in the rack, can be launched every four seconds. Pretty hard to dodge or reflect that kind of APF SDS spray. Should you lose your gunner, the commander can take over the control of the gun. We doubt it'll happen often, though. Practically any penetration sends the whole crew of the Curassier straight to the hangar screen. As you might well remember, Marcel Bloch, an engineer and philanthropist, did not want to build military aircraft. He believed that a plane should serve people by making their lives easier and happier, not by bringing evil. With the onset of quick, all-metal cantilever monoplanes, Bloch was the first in France to dare to start a project aiming at a big four-engine plane of this type. And he finished it. The MB-160 was a real masterpiece that became a long-distance passenger airliner, a multi-purpose cargo plane, and even the first-of-its-kind flying hospital. France had something to be proud of. But the war was coming. Up until then, 
it never occurred to the French Air Ministry that they might need a quick modern heavy bomber. All the tasks they could foresee were given to tactical machines, the twin-engined Porte 630 and the heavier Le Or 451. And these machines were truly outstanding for their respective classes. In case any longer distances were to be covered, the heavy and clumsy Yish Farmans uh, could do it. The war, however, instantly proved them wrong. And you know how it goes with these emergencies. Monsieur Bloch, uh, you must redesign your aircraft into a bomber immediately. Monsieur Bloch himself knew that a war with Germany was inevitable, so he had already been reluctantly developing the single-engined MB-150 fighter and a twin-engined high-speed reconnaissance bomber, the MB-174. Moreover, he himself had offered to redesign his airliner into a long-range bomber multiple times before. But no, oh no, that would have been so expensive. Only three civilian MB-162 predecessors were made by that time, without a single centime invested by the defense ministry. But now, when Poland had been conquered and fierce air battles day and night took place over the English Channel, uh, all of a sudden, they demanded the whole army of long-range bombers capable of penetrating the German air defense at any time of the day, no less. Who could have pulled it off when the nation's air factories were basically receiving handfuls of modern air engines? Well, there was no time to find out anyway. The MB-162 assembly work, what few aircraft they could make, was on 24-7. The hull was changed to fit a bomb bay. Its survivability was increased and, of course, some guns were installed. And since the company was nationalized, the engineers had the all-knowing bureaucrats poking their noses everywhere as well. No small wonder they managed to build a single flying prototype by the spring of 1940. It was all in vain, though. On the 22nd of June 1940, France surrendered. The MB-162 made its maiden flight to get to Bordeaux, which hadn't yet, then, been taken by the Nazis. They soon captured it anyway, with no bombs ever hitting anything German, only to be studied by Focke-Wool specialists as the only bomber of its type, and disappear in the fumes of war. Marcel Bloch, as some of you historian enthusiasts might well know, refused to cooperate with the Nazis and spent the rest of the war in Buchenwald, ready to die on any day. But that isn't the end of the story. The engineer miraculously managed to survive the war and get back to work. Thus, his four-engine plane was reborn. Not as a bomber anymore, though, but as the author had originally intended. More than a hundred of the passenger and multi-purpose cargo MB-161 planes were made. They couldn't compete with the latest American airliners during the early jet era, but what they could do was to bring French passenger liners back to life, make the flights regular, and inspire the people for a better future. Exactly how Marcel Bloch wanted it. Today, we're going to test planes whose main purpose is to wreck enemy ground vehicles. Please welcome the American PBJ-1H, the German ME-410B-1, the Soviet TIS-MA, the British Firefly FR Mark V, the Italian SM-91, and the Swedish T-18B-1. As usual, all planes will be fully upgraded and carry a minimum fuel load, while radiator control will be in the hands of the pilots. In actual battles, these planes often need to escape enemy fighters attacking them, so the first trial will check their top speed near the ground. 
Let's go. With engines roaring, the planes take off. The Soviet and the German crews are in the lead. Then the Italians and the Swedish, while others lag noticeably. Here's the American machine reaching its top speed. Then the British, and here's the SM-91 and T-18. The second to finish is the T's MA, while the leader in this stage is the ME-410. Well, when you can't escape a fight, you have to face it. So the second stage will check our contestants' armament. For targets, we'll take a couple of Friedrichs. One would attack from the front, while the other from the rear. The British Fireflyer drew the first match. Its battery of high-precision 20mm cannons wins the frontal attack easily. Uh, but there are no rear turrets. <laughs> Oops. Next is the Swedish machine. Its two nose-mounted 20mm cannons are a serious threat for frontal attackers. The only caveat is its ammo pool limited to just 60 rounds per cannon. Although the defenses are pretty poor too. A single machine gun covering the upper rear sector. Let's take a look at how the Soviet plane performs. Its frontal cannons explode the German fighter instantly, while the rear enemy poses the same problem as for the Swedish team. The ME-410 seems to be performing better. It has a couple of 20mm cannons in the nose with a hefty ammo pool that includes the famous Meinengeschoss rounds. Two turrets in the rear provide a much better cover. Here's the American plane. The PBJ is bristling, just like a hedgehog, with browning MGs on all sides. But the winner here is the Italian plane. No less than six 20mm cannons in the nose, with 1,800 rounds on board, and two-thirds of them being the famous Meinengeschoss. Moreover, the rear sector is defended by another 20mm cannon. Now, finally, the favorite part for many players. Hunting tanks. To make it more fun, we'll put out 10 Shermans onto the battlefield. The Italian pilot seems to be having difficulties. Its 100 kilogram bombs are too far from each other, so they have to align their aim with a single wing at a time. The Firefly performs better. Each of its eight rockets takes out a tank. The ME-410 pilot took a couple of bigger bombs, each destroying two enemy tanks. The Swedish and the Soviet pilots do the same, but they have more. The T-18 has four rocket launches, while the Soviet plane has 150 AP rounds in stock. The winner in this stage is the American PBJ. Four bombings and a 75mm cannon with AP rounds are to be reckoned with. Time for the award ceremony. The bronze goes to the American plane for its excellent weaponry. The silver is shared between the SM-91 and the T's MA. The Italian could have climbed higher but for its modest suspended armament and speed, while the Soviet plane lacks rear defenses. And the gold goes to the ME-410 for the best speed, excellent cannons and powerful bombs. Let's send our contestants back to their respective bases while we answer some of the questions from your comments. The first question was sent by a player called Sam Gaxtetter. Can you do a Metal Beasts or Pages of History on the HE-100? It's as fast as the Blitzkrieg itself and I love it. Hi there, Sam. We actually shared the story of this amazing fighter back in episode number 31, and covered its specs in the Metal Beasts section of episode number 67. We know it was pretty long ago, but the episodes are still available. Wilma asks, 
When I put armor-piercings ammunition in my F4EJ primary weapon, does the 3 pod also get those rounds, or is it something else? Hi, Wilma. If the gun in the pod is identical to the main caliber, it receives the same ammo. So, if you choose the AP belt for your main gun, the gun pods will get AP rounds too. Another question comes from Christoph429. Is there an option to disable voice chat completely? Hello, Christoph. Yes, you can do that. You can find it here in Options, Voice Chat. Ozzy writes, I'm having troubles figuring how the radar for the Yak-38 and the K-50 work. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Any tips? Hello, Ozzy. The thing is, they don't have radar. What they have is radar warning systems. It's an indicator that only shows up when your vehicle is under someone else's radar. And the last comment for today was written by Diego La Verde. Can you incapacitate an exposed crew member with a smoke grenade? Like in the 222 armored car or the ZIS-30? Hello, Diego. It's pretty tricky to pull off, but doable. Here's a demonstration. See for yourself. But once more, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Go on, subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss any of our fabulous videos. I say fabulous because I narrate them. And remember to leave a like because you do. And share your thoughts and comments because we love them. And we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.